Joseph Kelly joins us again on Liberty Chronicles for part two of our interview about his recent book, Marooned, Jamestown, Shipwreck, and a New History of America's Origins. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Shifting our narrative over across the water back to Virginia, uh, it's a mess. It's a total mess. It's definitely a failing colony. People are starving. Uh, the population is disappearing, the English population. The Native Americans are doing just fine. Uh, there are rumors that John Smith wants to set, him up, set himself up as sort of a pirate king of Virginia uh, along the James River. Tell us about yeah. what is going on in Virginia, yeah. and especially with, yeah. with attention to the fact that really this is still Tenacomoco or Native American yeah. territory. It's barely Virginia. Right. Right, right. Yeah. So this is this is you know, while all these events are taking place in Bermuda, and 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 even as the ships are sailing or getting ready to sail from England, it, it's a meanwhile back at the ranch situation in Virginia. From the very get go, uh, the Virginia Company uh, governance had proved itself to be incompetent in Virginia. From from you know April 1607 when they first come into Chesapeake Bay. By the time we get to the fall, half the people have, have died, uh, mostly of disease, but of course that disease is exacerbated by their malnutrition. Uh, the president, uh, you know, of course, John Smith himself began the plantation of this colony in chains because he had been suspected of sowing rebellion even before they arrived in Virginia. His, his Chief kind of uh, opponent was uh, Edward Mariah Wingfield, who becomes the first president. And when they get to Jamestown, Wingfield suspects him of of insurrection even before they get there. So they put him in chains, and and, and Wingfield actually wants to execute him in Nevis when they stop in the in the Caribbean islands. Uh, but Newport prevents it from happening. When they get to Jamestown, they, they break open a secret box, which is going to tell everybody who the counselors are, who are going to be governing. They don't know who, who's named by the, by the company until they get there and they break it open. And lo and behold, one of the names on the list is John Smith. So they, they basically have to let him out of his, his imprisonment and, and allow him to, to help with the governance of Virginia. But there's factions from the, from the get go. And, you know, with, within six months, Wingfield is deposed by a faction that John Smith is, is a part of. Another counselor is executed. Uh, the faction that deposed King Win uh, President Wingfield in, uh, splits into two factions, the Smith faction and the Ratcliffe faction. So from the whole first two years of Jamestown is this, this history of factionalism that contributes to, to their incompetence in providing for the settlers. So from the very beginning, the settlers could recognize this and they saw that this was a disaster and they begin deserting. From the very first summer, they are deserting to Indian camps. And so uh, down there on the, on the grassroots, the, the English settlers have these fantastically uh, friendly and productive relationships with the Indians, even as some of the Native Americans are attacking the fort and, and some of the, you know, the English are, are, are fighting some of the Native Americans. Down here on the grassroots, there's, there's a black market going on and there's all sorts of interactions. There's probably a lot of uh, sexual interactions between the English and the, the Algonquins because we know from what we know of uh, Algonquin society, uh, unmed young women were, were sexually active and there's no, no taboo against that. So there's all sorts of unofficial ties going on on the low level, on the grassroots level. And uh, these continue on for two years. I mean, what's remarkable about uh, when John Smith eventually gets uh, dictatorial powers, um, when he becomes president, uh, what's remarkable about his presidency, he's, he kind of he kind of puts an end to this. He starts uh, actually billeting his his people in Indian villages, but he knows where they are. Uh, he can't feed them in Jamestown, so he starts putting them in Indian villages. And essentially what, what John Smith is doing is what uh, Wingfield had, had accused him. Uh, Wingfield was afraid that he was going to be doing this, uh, was at setting up his own kingdom on the James River. Um, 
I don't think this is, again, this is uh, maybe a, a kind of controversial interpretation of John Smith, but I, I think the evidence makes it pretty incontrovertible uh, that John Smith, he doesn't set himself up basically as a pirate king. I think the, the, uh, the analogy, the best analogy would be he sets himself up as a werewolf. He's, he's a, a uh, paramount chief in the, the same way that the structure of Algonquin society on the Chesapeake was set up. Uh, the man we know as Pal Houghton, of course, is a parent, paramount chief of, you know, maybe uh, high 30s, uh, maybe 35 to 40 different districts on the Chesapeake. Most of what we know is that the, the James, the York and the Rappahannock and even half the Potomac rivers were under his jurisdiction, of, if you will, as, as a paramount chieftain. And what John Smith does is he sets his own paramount chiefdom up on the James River. He separates the districts, the Native American districts on the James River from what, what is sometimes called the Powhatan Confederacy. So he becomes a rival to Wahoo Sunakak, uh, the man we know as Powhatan. Uh, so it's not really a pirate king, but he has set, set himself up as, as, as this chief and he has pretty much dictatorial powers. But because he, he acts as a dictator, he's got you know, a lot of those grassroots settlers are, are very uh, disgruntled with his rule. And they are, they're deserting. They, they continue their desertions and, and uh, they aid Powhatan in his attempts to uh, overthrow, get, get his districts back from, from John Smith. So essentially there's like a civil war going on on the Chesapeake and John Smith is allied with some Indian districts and there are several English and other settlers, some German settlers as well, who are allied with Watha Sunnecock on, on the York River. So it's, it is just as crazy what's going on in Jamestown as, as, as what was going on in Bermuda, except writ larger because there's, there's more people involved. Uh, so this is the situation. Well, you know, eventually John Smith, uh, he loses his own power struggle to the English. And that's what you know, that's the, the famous starving time that, that leads to cannibalism happens after James Smith, uh, who has been wounded in, in what was probably an assassination attempt, uh, heads back to England. Uh, the failure of the, the sea venture, which got shipwrecked in Bermuda, the failure of it to arrive in Virginia begins the starving time. They didn't get the provisions that they expected from the sea venture because, because John Smith is gone. Their relations with the Indians completely deteriorate. So Jamestown starves. And this is what, uh, you know, once Governor Gates uh, has built this ship in Bermuda and forced the settlers in Bermuda to get on board and sail to Jamestown, they imagine that they're going to be rescued as they sail into Jamestown and they're going to find a, a vibrant colony that is, that is flourishing. And instead what they find are, you know, people who are lying in their cots starved to death, another basically skeletons stumbling out of their, their roofless huts in, in Jamestown, uh, holding out their hands to, to these shipwreck castaways from Bermuda and looking for, for rescue from the castaways themselves. You know, horribly ironic situation. So what happens in, in immediately then is, is everybody, even, even Governor Gates recognizes how how, how really precarious the situation is. He demands that, th that they spend at least a couple of weeks trying to make it a go in Jamestown, but, but he, after those couple of weeks, even he has to give in and recognize that this is not gonna succeed, that, that they better sail back to England right away or else they're all gonna starve. And they get on the boats and they start sailing down the river. Uh, as they leave Jamestown, the settlers desperately wanna burn the place down to make sure that they are not brought back to it and, and essentially, you know, enslaved again. Governor Gates prevents them from, from burning it down. Uh, you know, that, that's his, his uh, little Pyrrhic victory as they get on the boats and they start sailing out. And lo and behold, before they make their way out of Chesapeake Bay, the fourth resupply shows up with the new governor who's bringing with him his own retinue of soldiers who forced them all to go back to Jamestown. And, and then what ensues in the next year is maybe the worst, uh, not, not for starvation, but certainly for 
you know, considering Jamestown a slave labor camp. Um, governor, uh, the, the new governor is, is, is a baron. He's a, he's a lord in England, so he's got tons of status. Uh, baron Delaware, our Delaware comes from, from his name. And uh, he, he, he spreads the colony out. He's got hundreds of new settlers and, 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 a, and a giant contingent goes up to basically around the Richmond area where the falls of the James River are the, the highest navigable point. And there's a big rebellion up there where every, you know, we, probably dozens of people are trying to escape to the Indians to escape out of the English jurisdiction. And many of them are caught and they're, they're horribly tortured in ways that are just, you know, just horrible, horrific to, to think about. Uh, the worst case is they're, they're chained to trees and made to starve to death slowly. So their, their fellows can see them starving and, and therefore be terrorized away from from stealing their own labor away to the Indians themselves. So the whole first three years of Jamestown is, is basically this, this struggle from common laborers who discover, you know, what the, what the reality on the ground is and who, who try to escape. Many of them do. Many of them do melt into Native America. Um, others get caught, get tortured, become examples for, for their fellows who didn't make it out. And that's basically, you know, it's a, it's a cycle that goes on and on. There's, uh, I counted 14 different instances of what, what are described of as mutinies or insurrections by the Virginia Company in the first three years of, of the Jamestown settlement. And a, a lot of those uh, will eventually emphasize Stephen Hopkins-like language uh, that essentially we didn't – look, we didn't consent to all this. So then exactly. the, the most yeah. amazing thing perhaps about somebody like Stephen Hopkins or him in particular here is that this guy ends up signing the Mayflower Compact. <laughs> yes. How does that happen? Yeah, as, I, as, as I said, uh, a true stranger than fiction, right? You, you can't make this stuff up. And, and again, this is something that, that people have known you know, basically since it happened. Uh, and yet people don't seem to have made much of it. Even Caleb Johnson, the, the guy I mentioned who is the biographer of Stephen Hopkins, he does, he, he kind of suggests that he probably had a hand in, in the composing of the Mayflower Compact. Uh, I think circumstantial evidence demonstrates that he, he, he had more than just a little hand. He, he must've been the one who was dictating the terms of it. If you, if you read William Bradford's uh, Of Plymouth Plantation, the way he describes the circumstances leading to the Mayflower Compact is that because the Mayflower had gone off course and it was, it was, you know, they had a patent to settle in territory that was governed by the Virginia Company and they were far north of the territory that the Virginia Company was allowed by, by its charter. So strangers among them, and, and Bradford describes, you know, the two classes of people on the Mayflower as strangers and saints. And the saints, of course, are the people we know of as pilgrims. And the strangers are those people, those settlers who are not part of the pilgrim congregation. The strangers were arguing that because they were about to settle in territory that was outside the Virginia Company jurisdiction, their contract with the Virginia Company was dissolved. It was basically did, did not apply. And once they set foot on land, they would be free to do whatever they chose to do. This is the very language that Stephen Hopkins used to uh, persuade people to his conspiracy in Bermuda. Um, according to William Bradford, that's what triggered the need for the Mayflower Compact. And then we look at the language of the Mayflower Compact that, you know, we, we Chinese enter into this civil body politic. This is exactly what Stephen Hopkins was arguing that the settlers were going to do if they were able to get themselves off to their own island in, in the Bermuda Islands and, and set up their own uh, village, their own little town. Uh, so the very language uh, that leads up to the, the Mayflower Compact and the Mayflower Compact itself is identical to what the disgruntled settlers were trying to do in Virginia. Um, and amazingly, I think this is, I mean, what, a, a, another thing that's not been, um, not been recognized by historians, which uh, I, I don't understand why not, is, is that this circumstance, I mean, in order to, to, to be thinking the way Stephen Hopkins was thinking, you know, we, we were entering into a contract or we were 
governed by a contract. That contract is dissolved. Now we are essentially political free agents. That whole concept depends on this confrontation with the wilderness, you know, where you are standing in territory that is not governed by any European power, which is what was the case in Bermuda, of course, and what was going to be the case in Plymouth when when the voyagers on the Mayflower set foot on, on dry land. They were going to be entering into a wilderness that there was no patent for it at all. So they, they were entering into essentially what we, we now know of or describe of as the state of nature, man in the state of nature, where each individual is disconnected by any kind of obligations to every other individual and free to enter into any kind of set of mutual obligations where you give up certain rights in order to uh, secure certain protections. So, of course, this is the language that John, uh, that, that Thomas Hobbes and, and John Locke are going to use later on in the 17th century, but Stephen Hopkins is, is pioneering this very concept 30 years before Leviathan is published, 40 years, 40 years before Leviathan comes out. Um, now, of course, I'm not, not suggesting he uses that language of the state of nature, but I think even for those, for, for Hobbes to conceive of the state of nature requires this confrontation with the wilderness that was taking place during the age of ex exploration and was being lived out by Stephen Hopkins, both in Bermuda and then in Massachusetts. Yeah, and it, it seems to me, you know, you go almost two centuries later and Tom Paine yeah. is there talking about how this is what America should be. It should be a society Absolutely. built from the yeah. bottom up. We have an opportunity to, to begin government at the right end. Mm. Uh, just exactly. like, like yeah. on Hopkins, Bermuda. And, yes, and, and, and this, is, this is why I think this story is so important for us, for, for us to, to, well, for, for people today to hear this story. It's important for me to tell this story. And what I certainly hope is that this book will uh, kind of uh, inspire further research into what is going on in early America. Uh, essentially, what, what, what I'm suggesting is we rethink of these, these settlements uh, as examples of the frontier thesis. You know, the first American frontier, of course, was the, the coastal plains up to the fall line, uh, whether it's in Massachusetts or whether it's down on the Chesapeake Bay or, or in Bermuda, for that matter. Um, it, I, I think uh, we need to rethink what is the origin story of America, because the What's powerful about this story is the notion that we as Americans are the inheritors of this uh, people in the state of nature who enter into uh, a contract with each other. Um, and we do this in, in every generation. We need to renew it in every generation so that people here today in 2018, here it is election day right today, right? What are we doing except entering into a contract of mutual consent with each other. Um, that's what's uh, particularly, uh, I, I think, important and emphasized in the Hopkins story, in, in the story of castaways and maroons, people being hurled into the wilderness. And it's a corrective, I think, for what is pretty much, you know, the reigning uh, king of American origin stories, which is, which is the Pilgrim tale. Um, now, of course, they're, they're people entering into the frontier, too, but they the, the, the myth that we get with the pilgrims uh, is, is very different than the myth that I'm suggesting we ought to think of as, as our origin. The, the, the central you know, thesis, if you will, of the pilgrim story uh, is a parallel to Exodus. And, and this is, of course, how William Bradford imagines the pilgrims themselves when he's writing a Plymouth plantation. Uh, God's chosen people who are oppressed to escape their bondage and head out into the wilderness, but the wilderness is a promised land, right? A land of milk and honey. And they uh, make a covenant with God, the, the promise, the, 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 uh, the chosen people. The covenant, and this covenant is actually pretty well articulated in 1630 by John Winthrop on, on the Arbella as He's coming to settle the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, the covenant says, uh, hey, you know, if, if God will prevent us from shipwrecking, if, if he can keep us 
from crashing and uh, being hurled into the wilderness, we will remain faithful to him. And, and that's essentially what uh, Puritan society in Massachusetts ends up doing. And they end up setting up a theocracy, that city on a hill image. Uh, it's a city on a hill because it remains faithful to this particularly kind of strict interpretation of Christianity. And by the second and third generation, already people like William Bradford are complaining about the backsliding of, of the settlers. So the problem with Exodus is not just that we think of ourselves as the chosen people of God, but that whenever you think of yourselves as the chosen people of God, if, if you think of the foundation of our nation as being a covenant between ourselves and God, as, a, as opposed to a covenant between each other, a contract between each other, Always in the second or third generation, what follows the Exodus story is a Jeremiah. And, um, you know, the great critic Sackman Berkovich recognized this back in the 1970s as a particularly distinctive form or genre of American discourse, uh, American literature and also American political discourse is the Jeremiah, where a, a prophet rises up to harangue the current generation for not being faithful to the past, for not being true to the principles of our forefathers. Um, so when you have the Exodus tale as, as your foundation myth, that's always going to be uh, uh, succeeded. The sequel to Exodus, if you will, is going to be the Jeremiah. And, and what that demands of the present generation then is that not that we ourselves make decisions about entering into a mutual contract with each other, but that we ourselves are bound to remain faithful to something in the past. Now, what that thing in the past is or what our image of that thing in the past is, is going to vary from generation to generation, which is why you have Ronald Reagan, you know, resurrecting this image of a city on a hill for the United States. Uh, and describing that city on a hill in, a ter in terms that would actually be abhorrent to the pilgrims themselves. You know, uh, William Bradford bragged about how unfree this society was that he established in Massachusetts. It, it, he, he was very happy that, that uh, Plymouth Plantation was less free, there was less liberty there than in England. And that was, that's what made the city shine, you know, in, in his view. So Ronald Reagan, of course, borrows that image, but, but he says the city is shining because of the virtues of liberty and equality. Um, so the version of the past is going to be different depending on, on, on whoever is, who is, you know, the, who is the Jeremiah <laughs> crying in the wilderness. And he's going to give us an image of a past that we have to remain faithful to. Um, but in my mind, that's, that's not a very healthy way to think about our democracy. Joseph Kelly teaches literature at the College of Charleston, and I really cannot recommend his latest book more highly enough. Along with good old Benjamin Lay, I say let's go ahead and name Stephen Hopkins another patron saint of Liberty Chronicles. And the Kiss My Arse guy, too. Gotta love that. It doesn't get much more genuinely American than this. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.